Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm, I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Dave McCoy, who's the Executive Director of Citizen Action in Albuquerque, a watchdog group that's overlooking and overseeing and examining and trying to protect us from two major uh, uh, spills uh, or leakages into our aquifer. One, the uh, Kirtland Air Force Base spill, a horrendously large thing um, uh, of jet fuel, and the other, uh, uh, something called the mixed waste landfill, which uh, Citizen Action has been working on and, and uh, watchdogging since at least uh, 2000. Uh, in my judgment, Dave McCoy is, uh, is going to tell you the straight story, and uh, probably one of the only people who will around here. So I'm really happy to have you here, and honored to have you here, and um, I got a lot of questions I want to ask you. Thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. You've got a magnificent library here, too. I'm, I'm impressed. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I'm sure our readers um, and our listeners and our viewers are at least cognizant of what these two major uh, threats to our environment are, but I really would love to get us uh, on record here uh, of you explaining what the Kirtland Air Force Base spill is, how big it is, what kind of monitoring is being done, if the if uh, if the procedures involved are useful to uh, to begin what would seem to me to be a probably a hundred year long uh, cleanup effort. Uh, if it went well, at maybe billions of dollars, I don't know. And also the mixed waste landfill, too. So I'm going to ask you first to describe uh, the Kirtland Air Force Base spill. The Kirtland Air Force Base spill uh, was first discovered in 1992, although the Air Force denies that. Uh, they claim that they only knew about it in 1999. But there was a pump house uh, where they found contamination, and the EPA said, gee, you better explore that. It's, uh, uh, you don't know how far it goes. And uh, so Kirtland uh, dug some boreholes that were 12 feet deep and, and never really followed the pipeline that went down to the uh, offloading racks where they discovered the leak in 1999. The way they discovered the leak was through pressure testing of the uh, pipeline. And there were Air Force regulations that required pipeline testing going back into the 1950s, and those were never followed. In fact, in 1985 and then again in 1994, Kirtland gave itself waivers against doing the pipeline tests that were required. So they could have discovered this much earlier than they did. Uh, when they first uh, uh, had the pressure test in 1999, they said it was a 157,000-gallon leak. Uh, that uh, progressed to um, 1 to 2 million gallons, and then uh, 8 million gallons in 2010 was the estimate. And then uh, more recently, in 2012, they estimated the spill at 24 million gallons of jet fuel and aviation gas the um, dangerous part of this plume, it's all dangerous, but the most significant part of this plume comes from a chemical known as ethylene dibromide. Ethylene dibromide, uh, if I had a half teaspoon of it in my hand, it would be enough to contaminate 9 million gallons of water. That's 15 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Now, in every gallon, there was this half teaspoon of ethylene dibromide in the aviation gas. So uh, there were potentially millions of gallons of aviation gas spilled, and that gets into a range of mathematics that's difficult for me. Uh, but I think it's in the trillions of gallons, potentially, of, of groundwater that can be uh, contaminated in our, in our aquifer uh, by that amount of uh, ethylene dibromide, the abbreviation for its EDB. The ethylene dibromide is incredibly toxic in parts per trillion. Uh, the EPA uh, recommendation for the amount of ethylene dibromide in your water is zero. Uh, the detection limit for it is 10 parts per trillion. Um, 
But the drinking water limit in New Mexico is 50 parts per trillion, even though it's harmful at any level. And that level of contamination that can be allowed in New Mexico water is five times higher than California, Massachusetts, Florida. They have, they have only allowed 10 parts per trillion, which is right at your detection limit. So they don't want any of this. It's, you know... Uh, can cause uh, kidney cancer, uh, you know, s- severe illnesses, really bad stuff. Uh, it was used as a pesticide um, in the uh, many uh, states. Uh, in the aviation gas, it was u- used as an anti knock compound. So there was quite a bit of this stuff that was released. How much, they don't know. And um, the... Um, ethylene dibromide dissolves into the groundwater. It moves just about 99.7% with the groundwater. So once you've got it in the groundwater dissolved, it's moving. However fast the groundwater is moving, that's how fast the ethylene dibromide is moving. It's headed towards the uh, major uh, producer production wells for the city of Albuquerque. And the first wells that it would uh, encounter would be the Ridgecrest wells. There's five of them uh, to the northeast. And uh, those wells produce around 2,000 to 2,850 gallons a minute. Uh, So that drawdown creates what they call a hydraulic gradient, which is an angle that... uh, in the, in the ground, and depending on the material in the soils, rock, sand, gravel, clay, that kind of thing, that determines how fast it's going to move through that matrix to the wells that are pumping. Um, the city of Albuquerque has said, well, if it hits the wells, they'll shut those wells down. Um, but the problem is there's many wells to the north, and you can see it on a, a map of the well, f- well fields for Albuquerque. And those wells to the north, uh, several of them are higher in arsenic. Mm-hmm. And the good thing about the Ridgecrest wells at present is they're lower in arsenic, and they can blend those arsenic levels down to where it's an, ex- an acceptable drinking water level. Not that that's necessarily healthy for you to have any arsenic in your water, but it does comply with the EPA standards. So uh, the big worry here is twofold, and you only hear one side of it being talked about, and that is how soon will it arrive at the municipal wells? But the bigger question is how much groundwater is being contaminated by the ethylene dibromide and the other chemicals in the diesel fuel, and there's a lot of them, uh, that's, that's an even larger question because it makes uh, the most productive portion of Albuquerque's aquifer basically contaminated to the point where um, it, it won't be usable. It just won't be usable. And uh, there was a fellow Mark Evans from the Agency for Toxic uh, Substances and Disease Registry who came out, and somebody in the audience said, well, what's going to become of our aquifer? And I know you'll love this terminology. He said, Albuquerque will have an orphaned aquifer. And you wrote that book called The Orphaned Land, so I thought you might appreciate (laughs) that. But I guess an orphan aquifer is an aquifer that even its parents don't want anymore, you know? So... Uh, this this has got ramifications for uh, decades and decades out. They don't. They have no idea how long it's going to take to clean this up. To date, they haven't withdrawn one uh, gallon of jet fuel from the aquifer. The only thing that they've taken out of the soil, which is above the the groundwater table, has been uh, um, soil vapor, and that was done using uh, soil vapor evaporation equipment. They call them soil vapor extractors. And uh, they only had four of those operating. 
that they installed over a five-year period after they discovered this, um, or say they discovered it. So from 2004 to 2009, they had these four extractors working, uh, and they were good. It was good equipment, but they didn't have enough. If they'd have installed 16 of them, like uh, uh, the Environment Department wanted them to do, it may have... Uh, it may have been much more effective, but they didn't. And uh, um, so in the meantime, uh, because of conservation measures by the city of Albuquerque, use of river water uh, instead of mining the groundwater resource, uh, what's happened is the groundwater rose. So the um, uh, diesel fuel, uh, they call it El Napple, that was floating on top of the aquifer became submerged. So now you have this tremendous uh, volume of uh, uh, petroleum products that are dissolving into the aquifer. Uh, rather than floating on top of the groundwater, they're dissolving into the aquifer. If they don't do something about this, uh, nobody denies that this plume of contamination can hit the municipal wells. The question now is, what are they going to do about it? So let's just uh, try to try to get the technology a little bit down here. So, in order to be able to characterize a plume of that magnitude, you have to have quite a lot of wells placed strategically. Uh, it's my understanding that there are not enough wells, uh, test wells, monitoring wells, and that they aren't in the right places. For instance, they aren't between the plume and and the city wells that would have to be closed if if the plume reached. So that's one question. Uh, uh, the other technical question that I'm the, I'm the most worried about and the most interested in, I guess, is uh, how do you clean that stuff? How do you remove it from water? And how do you... Um, and is it ever possible to make it potable again? Well, in answer to your question about the monitoring wells, I'd like to back up just for a minute. Um, there's supposed to be, uh, this is all under federal law, okay? And the New Mexico Environment Department is the surrogate for the EPA on this. They're supposed to apply the federal law. Uh, and uh, they're supposed to come up with what's called a site conceptual model. And what that is, is an overall look at the problem before you even start on this. And they're supposed to make this, this model of, okay, where do we want the monitoring wells? You know, what do we know about this? How do we integrate the information, uh, manage it? Uh, uh, how, do we, how do we need to go about solving this problem? Now, that has never been done for the site. So it's kind of like a chicken with its head cut off in a, in a sense, you know. Sure, they can put in monitoring wells here and there, you know. Uh, they can get certain amounts of data, but there's no overall conceptual program of how they're going to go about putting this in place. So there, there's not a coordinated managerial approach to this situation. Now, you're absolutely correct. In order to do remediation, you have to do characterization. Now, the characterization is how long is this spill? How wide is this spill? How deep is it? How fast is it moving? Okay? They don't have the data. If, you're, if your uh, well, well field that you're concerned about is up here, and your jet fuel spill is down here, well, you need monitoring all the way from where the spill is up to the municipal wells. And that does not exist. Um, the uh, 115 or so wells that they do have in place are close, rather closely clustered around the central part of this um, uh, release of contamination. Uh, there's a Na El Napo portion, that's the petroleum uh, products, that is, uh, uh, goes, 50 percent of that goes north across Gibson, and then the ethylene dibromide contamination goes much farther than that. It's about somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 feet away from the municipal wells. So it's, it's traveled over 
uh, 6,000 to 6,500 feet over the period of time that that uh, leaking was going on. So they don't really know where the leading edge is because they haven't put enough uh, monitoring wells in in place. And what they should do, according to uh, Robert Gilkison, who's a very fine hydrogeologist, and uh, Citizen Action has had the pleasure of working with him a lot over the years, they should put a, uh, an array of monitoring wells going right down the center of, of what this plume path uh, looks like mm -hmm. to determine where's the leading edge of this, what are the concentrations of this. Now, one of the things that they, they've done that uh, um, denies the public real information as to how large this is, again, if this is the spill here, they uh, give you the, the outer extent of this spill on their maps to 50 parts per trillion, which is the um, Environmental Protection Agency's uh, maximum contaminant limit that they'll allow in drinking water, okay? But since they can detect down to 10 parts per trillion, they could determine that this plume is really much larger if they went to that, <clears throat> if they showed that detection limit. The Water Utility Authority has been asking them to do that for some time, and they haven't done it. And it really, uh, it really distorts um, just how huge this uh, contamination is in terms of its extent. It's over, it's about a mile and a quarter long. It's at least a half mile wide. So this is substantial. Um, it's uh, extremely close to, if not in the Veterans Administration well. The VA well pumps about 72 million gallons a year. So that's 72 million gallons a year that the city of Albuquerque is probably going to have to make up if they hook up to the city water, if they haven't already done so. So uh, just to get something clear in my head, if they're, if they're measuring up to 50 parts per, uh, per trillion uh, and the EDB... Uh, permissibility is 10 and the and and indeed EPA says zero then they are uh, uh, severely underestimating uh, the uh, uh, the health risk of this of this plume uh, I think I'm getting that straight uh, you're nodding so I don't think I am but but let me ask you the the uh, what about the the quality of this monitoring that's going on I think that's I think that's really what I'm I'm worried about. The monitoring wells are placed in basically in clusters of three. So there'll be one that's uh, shallow, intermediate, and then deep. Uh, for some time now, the Environment Department has been uh, telling the Air Force, look, we don't trust your samples because they've got air bubbles in them. And the air bubbles destroy uh, knowledge of the levels of volatile organic compounds that are in the uh, samples. So the samples are not uh, reliable and representative from that standpoint. And there's uh, numerous of those wells that uh, have that uh, problem of the air bubbles in them. Uh, another uh, uh, situation is that for the shallow wells, where the well screen crossed the groundwater table, uh, the groundwater has now risen so that those shallow well screens are now submerged. So they're not giving reliable information. There's at least 10 of those that have been submerged. One of those is out by the Veterans Administration. So they don't know how much um, uh, uh, jet fuel is still at the top of the water table. And uh, that that all creates a problem. But the primary problem is, you know, you've read about this modeling that they did. The EPA did a model and then CH2 um, uh, did a model and uh, uh, the USGS 
U.S. Geological Survey is going to come out with a model, and uh, Shaw is going to come out with a model. Well, that's all fine and well, except that there really isn't the adequate data to even choose the correct model to use for this situation, let alone have input of the data into the model so that you're getting any kind of accurate uh, reading of arrival time. Uh, and so the modeling at this point is just inadequate to really give us any kind of true picture about the situation. They simply don't have the monitoring wells between the outer edge of this spill. They don't know where the outer edge is and, and up to the municipal wells. And so they need to put that in. The NMED is the Environment Department has asked for those wells to be put in. The Air Force said, well, we don't have the money for it, so they're not going to put it in, which brings us to the problem that the New Mexico Environment Department is really not pushing the on envelope here as they should be. They're in charge. They could make an order. They could say, put in all the monitoring wells we need. If you don't do it, we're going to take you into federal court. We're going to fine you $25,000 a day per violation. I mean, they've, they've got the bully stick, but it's not being used here. And, uh, you know, that, that may be political and, and people want to get along in the state and everything, but you've got the largest population in the state, the largest economic center in the state being put totally at risk by this, uh, this jet fuel spill if it's not remediated. And they haven't even done what they need to do over the last 20 years to adequately characterize this thing. So all this modeling basically is about trying to predict when this thing is going to get to those wells. Yeah, the modeling is to attempt to predict when it's going to get to the wells. It's also uh, geared towards, well, how should we do remediation? Where should we put uh, um, uh, systems? Uh, what kind of systems should we use to recover this material? Um, a lot of the anxiety in the public right now, having watched the uh, Air Force's um, lack of urgency on this matter, has been directed at the idea that, you know, this can be expensive to clean up. This can run into uh, who knows how many billions of dollars uh, in cleanup. And uh, is the Air Force really willing to get the funding necessary to clean this up? Or are they just, uh, you know, uh, dug in and uh, planning to allow this to hit the municipal wells. The wells will be shut down and supposedly we'll find another location to put uh, uh, more wells. Well, um, that's not an acceptable uh, pathway for this situation and it's not supposed to happen under the way federal law, federal hazardous waste management law is structured. They're supposed to uh, identify how big this is and then put in the proper technology. We don't think that the coordination between the regulatory agencies and the Water Utility Authority and Kirtland Air Force Base and its contractors has been adequate to uh, fulfill this mandate of the hazardous waste management law. And uh, so just recently, uh, we got uh, the uh, New Mexico legislature, House and Senate, passed a memorial to demand a, or request uh, that the congressional delegation get funding for a scientific team of uh, experts to form a task force to look at what needs to be done here, get a conceptual site model together, figure out what kind of technologies can be used, and assist the regulatory agencies in Kirtland Air Force Base in going forward with this. Now, we don't know if, if they're going to want to go along with that, but it certainly would be in everybody's best interest mm -hmm. for that to occur. So we're, we're hopeful that that will occur. And uh, Senator McSorley and Representative Stapleton uh, got that memorial through the, through the legislature. So we're, we're grateful for that. So I remember when I was writing about the, uh, the GE spill, in which the state sued GE and about 100 other contractors, subcontractors, $4 billion uh, because uh, their 
cleanup which was going on, it was already a decade into it, was not going to, to produce potable water. Uh, they're probably maybe 15 or 16 years into it now. They probably got uh, about as much left in order to get it up to some speed, but it's not drinkable. Are we looking at this kind of situation here? I mean, will this water, this particular water, in, a, in our aquifer ever be usable, even after remediation? Well, that's really a big part of the problem. You've got... Uh, levels of ethylene dibromide in the water that are 5,000 times over the maximum contaminant limit. And because the maximum contaminant limit is, is so small in part measured in parts per trillion, you've got to reduce the amount of contamination in the water by many, many orders of magnitude. And most of the places where they've had successful cleanups, they've only had to go a magnitude or two, you know, maybe maybe 10 times below what the, what the contaminant limit is. But here, you're thousands of times above it, you know. And uh, uh, like I said, they, they don't know the full extent of this contamination. They don't have enough monitoring wells in place to know just how high it is. Uh, now, when the EPA uh, model said it's going to arrive in 30 years at the maximum contaminant limit of 50 parts per trillion, well, how many years is it going to be that we're seeing trace amounts of this in the drinking water? Now, they say at present, well, the drinking water is safe. We test the municipal wells every month or so. Okay, but they're testing an 800-foot-long well, okay? It's got a well screen, 100 and, or 800 feet long. It's sucking in at least 2,000 gallons a minute. A monitoring well is about 10 to 15 feet long and ha takes very discrete samples. Uh, so... We have no way of really confirming that ethylene dibromide is not at the municipal wells right at this moment. We really don't have that in place. The only way they would know would be to follow uh, Resolution 1214 that the Water Utility Authority asked uh, for uh, monitoring wells to be put as close as possible to the Ridgecrest wells. That hasn't been done. The New Mexico Environment Department should have ordered that to have been done. Kirtland Air Force should have stepped up to the plate and said, yeah, we'll do that. We want to be that protective. We want to be that sure. We want to have those kind of sentinel wells in place for early warning. So, you know, the more you think about this, this stuff is, is really chilling. And, and there's another, another chilling situation, uh, which you've been monitoring for a very, very long time. It's called the mixed waste landfill. And... It's uh, uh, very close to Mesa del Sol, uh, up near, um, even close to the interstate um, on the Sandy Reservation, Sandy Labs Reservation. Um, could you describe that to us and uh, what's in it and, uh, and what, kind of, what kind of jeopardy that portion of the aquifer is in to these materials? The mixed waste landfill at Sandia National Laboratories uh, consists of unlined pits and trenches. They're rather uh, shallow. They're 20, about 25 feet deep, 15 to 25 feet deep, and uh, maybe 35 feet across. And these pits and trenches were used uh, from the period 1959 to 1988 to um, dispose of uh, the radioactive and hazardous waste from atomic bomb production. There's over a hundred radionuclides and uh, types of hazardous waste uh, in the mixed waste landfill. There's uh, 119 barrels at least of plutonium and americium waste. There's beryllium, um, uh, thousands of... Uh, tens of thousands of pounds of depleted uranium, tens of thousands of pounds of lead. Uh, there's cadmium, uh, chromium, uh, many solvents. There's PCBs, 
uh, perchloroethylene, PCE, uh, tetrachloroethylene, TCE, uh, lots of solvents. This is the worst type of waste that you can have because it's all just mixed in together. They threw these wastes in in flimsy uh, cardboard cartons and uh, plastic bags, uh, steel drums. The drums are corroding. Uh, we don't know exactly what's going on. Then uh, uh, early on, they in uh, 1989, they put in a monitoring. This this paper exhibit is really holding up here. Uh, so if your if your mixed waste landfill is here, they put in a background well down here, two upgradient wells here, and a, another well over here. And that was based on the assumption that the flow of groundwater was to the northwest. Well, within two years, they discovered it wasn't to the northwest. It was to the southwest. So all, all of their monitoring wells, except one over here, were out of position. So uh, did they <clears throat> take that into account when they took the data from them and presented it to uh, the uh, public hearing that they had in 2004? No, they didn't do that. What they did was they just took that data that they might as well have been monitoring on the far side of the moon. You know, they took that data and they said, there's no evidence of contamination in this dump. Well, of course there was no evidence of contamination. They didn't have groundwater monitoring wells in the right location in the first place to detect contamination. But as, as poorly positioned as they were, they found uh, that there was a uh, high... Uh, an increasingly high level of nickel so that they they knew that things were escaping they just didn't know how much uh, and these uh, nickel levels were way over the levels of uh, uh, the drinking water uh, limits that EPA sets so uh, they know that there's uh, their computer modeling showed that PCE would reach the groundwater by 2010 uh, that there was uh, chromium nickel um, cadmium down there. Uh, so we know that, that tritium has traveled at least 120 feet below the, the uh, trenches of the mixed waste landfill. They uh, uh, thought that that tritium level was going to reduce by half within 12 years, but it didn't. When they measured the soil levels in tritium, they found that it increased by 10 times, and, and at 50 feet level it was still increasing did they go and do more soil monitoring no below that level no <laughs> so it's a very dangerous um uh dump it's it's really a time bomb waiting to happen it's something that could be cleaned up and in the final order where they uh use this dirt cover remedy over the mixed waste landfill they said look <clears throat> We want this reviewed every five years for the feasibility of, of excavating it. Well, that five-year time that it was supposed to be reviewed for excavation has come and gone. And the Environment Department now wants to extend that out another five years to 2019. And uh, Sandia Labs is more than happy to go along with this, and I'm going to say it straight to you folks out there at Sandia Labs. You're being highly irresponsible with this. You're not communicating with the public. You're staying in your caves out there, and you're not coming out of them to talk about cleaning it up. And we want to know when are you going to clean this up before it becomes a major public health issue to the city of Albuquerque. Now look, if the DOE, the Department of Energy, can't make a facility at WIP that will contain radioactive materials as they said it would, five, uh, uh, nearly a half mile below the surface of the earth in salt mines. How secure do you think you've made us with a dirt cover over unlined pits and trenches where the wastes are being pulled down to the aquifer 24 hours a day and have solvents to facilitate the situation. We want you to come out and talk to us about when you intend to clean this up. Well, when I first started to hear about <clears throat> the mixed waste landfill, I heard that it was too dangerous to move. Um, and then I remembered uh, there's a uh, an elite uh, organization of realtors uh, 
uh, who said, uh, who wrote to Governor Richardson and said, please, you know, we can't have this thing up here. We're trying to sell property at Mesa del Sol. Will you please get them to move this stuff? That, that sort of fizzled. But I don't think I'd ever heard a bunch of realtors ever talk about <laughs> uh, groundwater contamination in my life before. Uh, so this, uh, this mixed waste landfill, as I understand it, is, is one of quite a large number possibly 200 other uh, uh, waste waste sites on the, on Sandy base um, but, but but that's another story but so um, what is the what is the resistance to to moving this I mean I know that that um, that when you read the uh, the Sandia website they take great pride in having removed many, I think something like 67,000 tons of, of plutonium off of their land in the last, uh, what, uh, maybe two or three years, as I understand it. Uh, so what's the problem with moving this stuff? Well, the Department of Energy <clears throat> would like to uh, use the mixed waste landfill as a sh sort of showcase, you know, for... Um, how they manage uh, hazardous and uh, radioactive waste that's in the ground. Uh, you know, they, they put a dirt cover over it, and then they supposedly monitor it, monitor it and uh, uh, then call it a, a uh, safe dump. And the reason they'd like to do this, use this as a showcase piece, uh, is because all around the U.S. at... Uh, uh, national laboratory sites, and the closest one would be uh, Los Alamos National Laboratories, where you have Area G with 63 acres. They'd like to do the same thing there, just cover it mm -hmm. and not have to excavate it, save the costs, you know, do whatever it is they want to do on uh, refurbishing nuclear weapons and uh, that kind of thing. You know, that's that's where they see the money and. Uh, our uh, congressional delegation really needs to get on top of this and tell Sandia that, uh, you know, they need to clean this mess up. Now, the same types of chemicals that went into the chemical waste landfill at Sandia Labs leaked into the groundwater, substantial quantities of TCE and PCE, and uh, they had to clean up that dump. And they did it using robotic equipment that's available. And those same types of waste that have contaminated so many other sites at Sandia are in the mixed waste landfill. So there's no reason to believe that those wastes aren't headed into our groundwater. They are in our groundwater to some extent right now. But because we have a defective monitoring network out there, we don't really know what the situation is with respect to how much contamination, how fast it's moving. They have no uh, no monitoring in the Vado zone, which is between the ground and where the groundwater is. There's no, no real monitoring going on there. Uh, the Environment Department has been, uh, they sued Citizen Action to keep us from getting a, what was called a uh, tech law document that was written about the dirt cover. This document said, hey, that, that dirt cover is not going to be uh, good for the time necessary to protect public health and safety. Uh, it's it's going to break up. They said you're not monitoring in the proper way. Here's the dirt cover. Uh, they said you should have monitoring right underneath the cover before the water goes through the cover down through the waste and and out of the trenches instead the monitoring is underneath the trenches so by that time it's too late they said uh, that beneath this dirt cover there should have been a non-permeable uh, liner that would carry moisture off to the sides so that you could uh, uh, pull out the leachate and that kind of thing so that wasn't in place. Now, the Environment Department kept that information from us for over three years until that after the cover was laid down. They sued us deliberately to keep us from getting that information. And uh, then in, 2000, in 2007, Robert Gilkison and I filed a complaint with the uh, 
uh, EPA Region 6 that the groundwater monitoring network was inadequate de to detect contamination. Um, the EPA Region 6 said that they were going to do a study of it. Uh, B Senator Bingaman requested it too. And uh, the study was supposedly done when I asked EPA Region 6 attorneys for it. They said, oh, there's no technical report on this. We filed a complaint with the Inspector General for the United States. And uh, uh, then uh, subsequently had to do a lawsuit to get this report. And we sued both the uh, EPA Region 6 and the Inspector General. When we finally got the re report about the groundwater monitoring, the EPA staff agreed with us on many of our concerns about these different monitoring wells that were there that were inadequate, said that there needed to be mon more monitoring to the north, there needed to be more monitoring to the south. So, you know, this whole thing uh, of leaving these wastes under a dirt cover comes as a result of uh, bureaucratic and administrative regulatory cover-up of the facts about the mixed waste landfill. And uh, Sandia knows it, and they're doing nothing about it. And again, I'll say they're being extremely irresponsible. Their management needs to address this situation. And some of the interviews we got from the Inspector General indicated that great pressure had been put on the EPA Region 6 staff not to have it look like uh, Anime D had been doing anything wrong with these uh, 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 monitoring wells, not to question the uh, results of past monitoring, not to question the solution. In fact, one guy said that their earliest drafts for writing this report would have um, negated that solution of the dirt cover. So there's been a lot of hanky-panky, to put it mildly, going on with the mixed waste landfill. You mentioned all the other dumps out there. There was a total of uh, around 568 dumps identified throughout Sandia Labs and Kirtland Air Force Base. And uh, many of those have not uh, been uh, adequately monitored. Uh, they've been put on what's called a no further action list, which means that, hey, they don't have to monitor them, they don't have to worry about them, just leave it as it is, you know. Now, what they tried to get early on, uh, and Citizen Action opposed it, was a no further action um, status for the mixed waste landfill. And this, you know, anybody who has looked at this dump um, uh, from an independent uh, standpoint of hydrogeology, the wastes that are in it have uh, said, look, this dump needs to be excavated. Now, uh, they've said, well, it was too dangerous to excavate. They've said two things. It was too dangerous to excavate, and then they said, it's a safe dump. It's a well-behaved dump. Well, if they don't excavate it sooner rather than later, what they're going to get is more and more deterioration of the containers that these wastes are in, and particularly should be worried about the plutonium waste, you know. Uh, so it's a dangerous situation. It's not monitored properly. It it uh, hasn't been reviewed for excavation. And recently, the Water Protection Advisory Board came out with a letter and said, "Look, the clock on this started running in 2010. You're four years late. It should be done right now in 2014." And the Environment Department uh, isn't getting with the program so citizen action filed a lawsuit against them on february 3rd saying look we don't want an extension this should be done now you need to review excavation for the mixed waste landfill what we're seeing with the with the Kirtland air force base bill is a similar set of delays and tactics and rigmarole and hanky panky if you will and monkey business not getting down to like getting cleaning anything, uh, and um, there's uh, there's quite a lot of of uh, quite a number of eyes from say the state legislature, particularly uh, particularly those who who come from Albuquerque who are looking at this really carefully and who are appalled, as we all are actually. I mean, anybody who knows anything about this realizes that this has been that this that this pattern at Sandia is now being 
applied up there at Kirkland Air Force Base too. Is that an accurate assessment in your judgment? What we're not seeing is the careful kind of oversight that should be done for these problems. We're not we're we're seeing a situation where the regulator, in in many instances, is too close to the polluter, and the bias is coming down in favor of the polluter. The bias is always seems to be uh, allow the um, poor. Uh, work that's done for monitoring, uh, sloppy work. Some of it's just outright sloppy. Uh, allow waste to remain in place in many instances and just not getting down to what regulators should do in terms of ordering cleanup. Air, if they're going to err, why aren't they erring on the side of public health and the environment? Right on. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I hate to say it, but we've run out of time, and uh, this has been really enlightening, and I hope all of us pay much more attention to these, these two issues and to all issues that have to do with groundwater in our, in our city and our state. Thank you so much, Dave, for being Thank with you. us. Thank you for staying on top of these issues. I really appreciate being able to meet with you, and you've been a longtime uh, supporter of uh, environmental cleanup, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you.